Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done 385 of them now, and if this is new to you, please go to batgap.com and look under the, what do I call it, previous, men, previous interviews or something, menu, <laughs> past interviews menu, and you'll see all the previous ones uh, categorized and organized in about five different ways. This show is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, and so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it in any amount, large or small, um, there are donate buttons on the site, a donate page that explains other ways of doing it if you don't like PayPal. <clears throat> My guest today is Dwayne Elgin. Um, Dwayne, well, or I'm going to read his bio in a, in a second, but I just want to say for starters that um, I really, I say this occasionally, I really enjoyed preparing for this interview. I, I had a cold this week, and so I, I was able to indulge myself and sit around a lot, and I managed to read all of one of Duane's books, The Living Universe, and um, a fair amount of a couple of other ones, The Awakening Earth and Voluntary Simplicity, which I have on the shelf behind me. I thought you forgot to get it here. Um, but I really, this, this kind of stuff, as you'll see in a, as we get going in this interview, is right up my alley. Um, Duane talks about a lot of things brilliantly that I often bring up in interviews and that really excite me. So <clears throat> I'm really happy to have him on the show. So welcome, Duane. Thank you, Rick. So good to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so let's do a little bio stuff on you. So Dwayne grew up, incidentally, Dwayne, I, everybody pronounces your name Elgin, but I could swear that in one of your interviews I heard you pronounce it Elgin. It's, yes, it's Elgin if you go to Scotland. Oh, okay. And it's Elgin in, uh, I suppose, in the United States. So I'm okay with either pronunciation. Okay, maybe we'll switch back and forth for the sake All of right. our Scottish listeners. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dwayne grew up on a farm in Idaho. And uh, was it a potato farm by any chance? Uh, there were potatoes, onions, uh, we had uh, apples and pears, we had uh, all kinds of crops. Uh, chickens and cows and pigs and all the rest. It was a farm, it was a big farm. Mm, sounds healthy. Um, and you worked there until you are like 23 years old on the farm. Well, obviously getting an education at the same time. Um, you've become an internationally recognized author, educator, speaker, and media activist. You have an MBA from the Wharton Business School and an MA in Economic History from the University of Pennsylvania. In 2006, you received the Peace Prize of Japan, the Goy Award, in recognition of your contribution to a global vision, consciousness, and lifestyle that fosters a more sustainable and spiritual culture. Your books include the ones I just lifted up, The Living Universe, um, Where Are We, Who Are We, Where Are We Going, that's the subtitle. Uh, Promise Ahead, A Vision of Hope and Action for Humanity's Future, Voluntary Simplicity Toward a Way of Life that is Outwardly Simple, Inwardly Rich, and Awakening Earth, which I also just held up, Exploring the Evolution of Human Culture and Consciousness. Also with Joseph Campbell and other scholars, you co-authored the book Changing Images of Man. And as usual, I'll be linking to all these books from Duane's page on BatGap. Um, in addition to that, you've contributed chapters to 23 books and have published more than 100 major articles. So in the 1970s, Duane, you worked as a senior staff member of a presidential commission looking 30 years into the American future. Which president was that, Nixon? Yes. Okay. And uh, how, to what extent did your prognostications work out? Uh, very, very much so. We, it was, we said in the early 70s, by the year 2000, there was going to be a water crisis in the southwestern United States, for example, <clears throat> in the Los Angeles, San Diego basin. It was very clear. Mm -hmm. And so here we are really facing a water crisis in that part of the world. And we have not anticipated in the way and, and, and had policies to respond as we could have. Yeah. So it was too little, too late. That's typical, a, for, yeah. yeah, typical and, and interesting when we consider global warming because there have yeah. been plenty of warnings and, and that's a much bigger and more global problem, Yeah, uh, which we'll talk, probably talk about. Um, so then let's see, you, um, you worked as a senior social scientist with the think tank SRI International, where you co-authored numerous studies of the long range future. In addition, for nearly three years while working at SRI, uh, in the early 70s, you were the subject in initial government-sponsored um, psi research into remote viewing and other intuitive capacities. 
and finally, over the past 30 years, you've co-founded three nonprofits and transpartisan organizations working for citizen involvement, empowerment rather, and a citizen's voice through creative uses of the new media that surround us. So, I thought we might start, Duane, if you don't mind, um, by talking a little bit about the, what you talk about in the appendix to, to this book, you know, The Awakening Earth, where you were doing intense spiritual practice and you had some kind of profound awakening. That might be, in the context of this show, that might be a good place to start. Um, what... Um, well, describe what happened. Describe what happened to you. I mean, you were doing what kind of practice and what kind of experience did you end up having? Well, this was uh, the experience you're describing was in 1978, mm -hmm. okay. uh, <clears throat> a long while back. Um, but I'd been uh, years before that, for about oh six, seven years before that, I had been deeply involved in Tibetan Buddhist uh, meditation. And at the same time, as you mentioned, I was involved with the parapsychology research there at the Stanford Research Institute. And so I was developing a literacy of consciousness, if you will, over a period of years, both uh, with feedback from uh, very sophisticated instruments and with uh, support from very sophisticated uh, teachers of meditation in the Tibetan tradition. And finally, I decided that uh, I had learned so much intellectually and so much intuitively, experientially, but the two were not coming together. Uh, I, I essentially had two lives. I had one life as a professional researcher and the rest. I had another life of deep spiritual practice and intuitive understanding, and they were not coming together. So I took a half year, essentially, in 1977 and 1978 to give myself the meditation space to bring those two together. And a after a half year, they hadn't. Uh, instead, I was more, more uh, overwhelmed than ever with, the, with these two different tracks of my life. And uh, what I did was I said, uh, this was utter desperation and utter confidence, if you will, combined, I said, I'm going to sit in meditation until it, my life does come together. And essentially, uh, I sat for three days um, straight. Without sleeping? And, uh, lightly two evenings. Mm -hmm. But it was a... It was... Um, uh, there's no way that I could describe the intensity of that. Uh, it would be, uh, oh, an analogy would, would uh, suggest. Imagine you have a, a 100 watt light bulb. And you take that 100 watt, watt light bulb and you put it up against a steel plate. And you leave it there for uh, uh, an hour, a day, whatever. It, maybe the plate's going to get a little warm. Now, on the other hand, if you take that same amount of power, 100 watts, and put it into a laser, it really focus, put it on that plate, and within an hour or so, you're going to burn a hole through that steel plate. And so the difference between the, the half year of uh, preliminaries, if you will, it was like just warming, 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 and finally those last three days, it was burning a hole through the ego eye that was holding me back from understanding the larger, uh, connecting with the larger universe, if you will. And so what finally happened was the universe uh, said, well, okay, here it is. Here's, here's who you are. Here's where we are. And in its utter simplicity, directness, uh, and what emerged was the, uh, just a very clear insight many people have had that I am a part of a larger aliveness. Uh, more than 2,000 years ago, Plato said, the universe is a single living creature that encompasses all living creatures within it. What I saw, okay, here I am. I'm a part of this larger aliveness. And uh, I'm no longer cut off uh, from myself and, and the cosmos. Rather, I am completely at home. And that's uh, and so it was no change other than feeling finally at home in the larger universe and knowing that that is who I really am. And that kind of stayed with you. Oh, yeah. 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 Nice. 
<clears throat> you didn't. Some people go through this, I got it, I lost it kind of thing for a while, but once you had that laser breakthrough, you, it sort of stuck. Huh? Yeah, it wasn't something that was added. It was rather something ta it's taken away. It was like uh, I had covered up that insight and what happened was, okay, it, let's take the cover off and just see clearly. And so, uh, yeah, so then that has persisted. Um, Great. Um, since you mentioned Living Universe, um, let's get right into that for a bit. Um, you wrote a book by that title, The Living Universe, yeah. uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And um, what's the basic premise of the book? Basic premise is uh, what I just quoted from uh, Plato, that the universe is not a collection of uh, bits and pieces, but rather it's, a, it's an integrated whole system. It's a cosmic hologram, if you will. Um, and we are an integral part of that wholeness. And, but the wholeness is not simply a mechanical wholeness, it's a living wholeness. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, enter into an understanding of that living wholeness uh, through our direct intuitive experiential uh, practice. And when we do, if we shift our understanding from a dead to a living universe, it transforms uh, our entire lives. It transforms uh, personally, societally, um, and we can explore that. But this is a, the key transition I think we're going through right now as a human family. To say, no, we're not living in this existential deadness, waiting for a miracle to keep us alive. No, we're living in deep aliveness right now. And we can grow into an economy uh, of aliveness, into uh, relationships that grow our, our sense of aliveness. Uh, and I think that is the, uh, the great transition that we're, we're beginning to make right now as a human family. Let's uh, go into what we mean by aliveness or living. I, I mean, obviously, we hear these debates. Is there life on Mars? You know, there's probably almost definitely not life on Venus, certainly not life on the sun. You know, yeah. the, so they're def referring to life as biological life yeah. uh, as we yeah. know it. Uh, but when you say the universe is living, I, I'm quite sure you mean everything. Neutron stars are living and uh, empty space is living and a rock is living. Yeah. So. Um, Clarify what you, how you would Good. define that. Good. Um, so uh, there are levels of aliveness, obviously, levels of aliveness. And uh, there's the foundational aliveness that, that Plato was speaking about, saying, well, the whole thing is a living system. And then within that living system, there are creatures of varying degrees of self reflective, self-organizing aliveness, if you will. And we happen to be a creature that not only knows uh, that we're here in, a, in this universe, we know that we know that we're here in this universe. We know that we know. Mm -hmm. And that's a higher level of aliveness. Uh, but that doesn't diminish the wholeness of the universe as an integrated living system. So how would you then say that? Uh, if, it's, if the universe is actually alive, it has to have a few basic properties that would go with any living system. Um, the first property is it must be a whole system. Uh, it can't be just a collection of pieces, it has to be an integrated whole. Now, uh, quantum mechanics is telling us, uh, deep down, non-locality says this is an integrated whole universe. Uh, there are a lot of uh, pieces, indeed, but those pieces are connected deep down into a wholeness as a living system. Second thing, if it's alive, it must have energy moving through it. Uh, now, it turns out 95% uh, of the known universe is invisible. It's dark matter and dark energy. There's immense amounts of energy uh, embedded and flowing through the universe. Uh, the physicist, David Bohm, said the universe is an undivided whole, it's unified in flowing movement. The universe is an undivided whole in flowing movement, it's arising moment by moment, and if we think about the energy it would take to bring this universe into existence moment by moment, it's phenomenal, it's unimaginable. So number two, where it's unified, it has immense amounts of energy flowing through it. Number three, there's consciousness at every level of the universe that we can look at, we can find evidence of a reflective capacity. The, for example, go down to the atomic level. The uh, uh, 
physicist, Nobel laureate Freeman Dyson said that the atom, uh, the electron moving around the, the, in the electron shell of an atom behaves as if it had a mind of its own, as if it had a mind of its own. This is the atom. And we can just go right on up the, uh, the chain to higher and higher levels of uh, organisms, and we can find evidence of a reflective consciousness at every scale. Uh, so that's number three. I mean, we see the capacity for uh, uh, consciousness and reflection. Number four, there has to be uh, some degree of um, uh, capacity for uh, reproduction, if you will. Uh, if it's a living system. And again and again, cosmologists are now saying, well, the universe has the ability to to seed other universes and every black hole on the other side of a black hole is probably a white hole and it's budding off a new universe, a new universe, and there are billions of them in our universe. So the point is, if we start adding up the attributes of living systems, and we say, does the universe have those attributes? Indeed, it does. Now, that doesn't prove the universe is alive, but it says, does it look like it's dead at the foundations, or does it look like it's alive? And I would say it's alive. It's, it, that's, and then you can ask, well, it looks that way, but what does it feel like? Uh, what is the experience that people actually have of this living in this living universe? Uh, but let me pause there before I... Sure. Yeah, see if there's uh, anything you wanted to uh, add, Rick, to that. You've obviously been interviewed a lot. You know that it's that, that you want to pause from time to time. That's great. Sometimes yeah, yeah. I have to cut people off. Um, yeah. Sometimes they have to cut me off. Um, but, okay, have, question. Have you ever debated any of the so-called new atheists, like Daniel Dennett or Sam Harris or, you know, Christopher Hitchens or any of those guys? Well, uh not those persons specifically, but certainly uh, people that uh, say, well, you're crazy if you think this is uh, a living universe. I just look around and uh, show me the, where it's alive. Another person will say, well, you're crazy if you think this is dead. Look at the beauty, the elegance, the, uh, the uh, design intelligence in the construction of the universe. It's so fine tuned to be as it is. Uh, and so what I am seeing is about 50-50, mm -hmm. and we can go into the uh, surveys that show this is actually pretty accurate for the population at large. About half the public says, well, of course it's a lie. The other half says, well, you're crazy if you think it's a lie. <laughs> and so this is truly a tipping point uh, for the culture. Um, because if, if you say it's a dead universe, well then, materialism makes sense. Consumerism makes sense in a dead universe. What have we got? Just a bunch of dead stuff. You better exploit it. You better use it up. Yeah, I remember James uh, Watt? Yeah. yeah he, was, he was uh, Reagan's Secretary of the Interior, I believe, and uh, his philosophy was, well, Jesus is coming anyway, and the whole, you know, the whole world's going to end, so let's just rape the environment as much as we can, you know, get, uh, yeah. get everything we can out of it. Yeah. So that's the uh, materialistic mindset of a dead universe. If it's a living universe, simplicity makes sense. You want to you want to take care of the aliveness of that living system, the Earth. Uh, you want to have a conscious regard for the universe that is your larger home. Uh, it just transforms the the way we relate to one another, to ourselves, uh, to what we're doing here. Uh, if it's a dead universe, well then, uh, why you know? It's going to take a miracle to save us. If it's a living universe, we're already deep into the aliveness. Right now, we're deep into the aliveness. Yeah. And what we're learning to do is live in that aliveness. That changes the entire uh, journey. Yeah. Um, in a way, it doesn't matter if half the people believe it is, or if no, none of the people believe it is, or if all the people believe it is, because it is what it is, regardless of what we believe. I mean, there was a time when people believed, most people believed the Earth was flat and that, that it was the center of the universe. Uh, but that the universe actually didn't care, you know, it, it, <laughs> it continued to operate the way it, it has been, regardless of what we little humans thought. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Um, when I think of this idea of a living universe, and I've, you know, I, I thought of, uh, I think about it a lot, and I've brought it up in many interviews, it's like we kind of take for granted what we're actually 
going through here, what we're actually experiencing. And if we pause to consider it for just a moment, take a look, take a look at a blade of grass or something, um, and you consider what science has told us about what's actually going on there, you know, and the amount of intelligence and orderliness that is operative at every single level from the cellular down to the subatomic, um, you, th you think, holy mackerel, it's, it's a total miracle. And yeah. um, it, it couldn't possibly be random. It couldn't possibly be arbitrary or capricious, little billiard balls somehow bouncing into each other and creating blades of grass and, and everything else. And you also think that, well, where could I possibly go where I wouldn't find that? And the answer is nowhere. I mean, as you were saying, the universe is a whole, it's a whole system. There's no gaps. I mean, there's, you could go anywhere, large or small, uh, near or far, and you're going to find laws of nature functioning in ways which we don't even fully comprehend and which are certainly and obviously not random. So, you know, when I ponder that sort of thing, I, I wonder how anybody who, especially a, a scientist, somebody who studies this stuff, could possibly think of it as dead. You know, uh, one of the most remarkable insights that I think has come from uh, modern science that relates to what you're saying, Rick, the miracle uh, of existence, is if you would imagine a ruler, a cosmic ruler, from the very largest to the very smallest scale. And uh, we look at ourselves uh, in the universe, we look out, we say, oh, we're so small, we're just so insignificant, we're so trivial in the larger cosmic scheme of things. But on this ruler, from the big to the small, it turns out humans are, are roughly in the middle. We're actually a little bit on the big side. And it means there's more smallness within us than there is bigness beyond us. And uh, it's extraordinary how much space there is beyond us. And it's just mind boggling to imagine how much more space is there in, within us, in smallness. And so we're in the middle ground. We're giants in this universe. We are literally physically giants. And we tend to diminish ourselves relative to the larger scale of things. And one, uh, one thing I love to do is to say, no, you're big, you're, you're creative, you're a creative giant in this living universe. Yeah. Well, that that's, triggers two thoughts in me. One is just to elaborate on the smallness bit. Like in your book, you mentioned that if, if an atom, uh, if you took the atom and, and you made the the nucleus the size of a, what, a golf ball, then the electrons would be about a mile and a half away, or at least the inner ring of electrons, whizzing around that yeah. golf ball at trillions of times a second. And so yes. uh, that's an interesting thing yeah. to consider, and it can, and reveals amazing dynamism. Plus, uh, I mean, the nucleus of an atom is ginormous when when contrasted with you know deeper more fundamental uh, more microscopic levels of of creation it's it's huge um i don't even know it might even be closer to us than in size than the the, the planck scale or something it is. yeah it is. there you go so <laughs> yeah no. So that's one thought and to think that you know each little atom is this perfectly functioning unit obviously not random obviously not arbitrary wow. um displaying marvelous laws of nature, which again, we, we still don't fully understand, and that um, there are more of them in a, in a handful of sand than there are stars in the known universe. I mean, just enormous amounts. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's, it amazes me. And, and like I said before, it's like we take this stuff for granted and we just call waltzing through our day, but there's this incredible, com profound complexity and sophistication in every little iota of creation. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So the second thought that that triggered, when you say, you know, we're giants and all that, um, w w if we ask, well, what, what do we mean by we? And when we consider that the real we, the real self that we are, actually does actually dwarfs the universe because it's unbounded, it's unlimited, it's, it's vast, then, and then we're really giants. Indeed, that's the biocosmic self. We are a part of the living universe. And uh, one key attribute of a hologram, if the universe is regarded as a hologram, is that each piece of the universe contains information about the whole. 
And that's where uh, so-called parapsychology and such makes sense. Uh, it's nothing more than the functioning of the quantum realm of non-locality. This is just how the universe works. There's nothing magical or mysterious about it. Um, so if we enter into that realm, we are entering into the non-local uh, reach of the entire universe. We're implicated into the entire cosmos. And so the idea that we could have cosmic consciousness totally makes sense. We're a part of the consciousness of the cosmos. And uh, people have that experience on an increasingly uh, more frequent basis. There's, let me share a statistic. It's really uh, empowering. In 1962, a survey was done in the United States to see how many people said they had had a mystical experience, a, a feeling of communion with the universe, a feeling of, of profound love at the foundation of the universe, a sense of peace and, and connection with it all. Uh, how many people had had that kind of experience? And it turned out in 1962, it was 22%. Year by year, that's been growing. The last survey that was done, it was in 2009, and it was 49% uh, of the American public said, yes, I have had a mystical experience. So we've gone from 22% to 49% over a generation, let's say. And it means we are at least as much a society of mystics as we are a society of materialists. Mm. And we are in a process of measurable transformation and change. I mean, this is measurable, transformation and change. Uh, and we're not really talking about it except on programs like this. Uh, what we're being told is, no, you are what you consume. Uh, be a good consumer, use your materialism to make you happy. And we're really creating a schizophrenic society because we're divided against our own aliveness. Mm. We're divided against our own aliveness. And the deepest wound that we have, I feel, as a human family is the wound of separation from the living universe. So as a futurist and as a, a scholar of cultures and their evolution, um, do you uh, ascribe to the notion that there is some kind of mass awakening taking place in the world? Uh, you know, the sort of new agey idea of a, a heaven on earth or an age of enlightenment uh, <laughs> coming along? Well, I, I think it's measurable that uh, there is um, uh, changing attitudes and values and perceptions, uh, just like I indicated. There's more uh, evidence than that. Um, so it's not a utopian possibility. This is uh, from a farm boy. This is from a farm boy saying, we got to get down to earth here and start handling things because we are in a time of great transition as a species and, and we are not stepping up to the game that's uh, called uh, from us. And um, so <laughs> that's why, you know. Good. Um, so, you know, I mean, I don't want to get too much into politics, but after the last election, you know, a lot of people were sort of, oh, I, got, I thought things were going to get so much better. You know, Bernie gave us a lot of hope and, and whatnot. And, and then, you know, the new administration comes in and appoints people like James Pruitt to the EPA and, you know, various appointments that seem so regressive and so, um, you know, inimical to uh, environmental issues and, you know, the welfare of the economy. I mean, we're setting ourselves up for another bank failure and so on. So uh, how do you put that in context of, of some kind of awakening taking place? And I know that you've said that in the 2020s, you felt like we we're going to really hit a wall in terms of the way we've been carrying on. Do you see yeah. this as a, a sort of a, a necessary um, acceleration of outmoded ways of thinking and doing things uh, that will bring us to that wall and uh, that we need to get to in order to to get beyond it yeah um, I, I see very deep driving trends at work uh, that are they, that are go beyond current politics I mean uh, I think current politics is is an expression of a deeper dynamic at work the unraveling of the industrial era paradigm. Um, let's look at the, the limits of what we're doing right now. It is helpful to just maybe start with that. Uh, if we look at just a couple of factors, population, climate, and such. Uh, when I was born, there were 2.2 billion people on the planet, 2.2 billion. There are now over 7 billion. 
It means in my lifetime, world population has more than tripled in my lifetime. If with any luck, it will more than quadruple in my lifetime because we're going from 7 billion right now towards 8, 9, 10 billion by mid-century. Now, the estimates are that the carrying capacity of the Earth is roughly 2 billion people living in middle-class Western lifestyles. That means we are billions of people beyond carrying capacity right now, and we're going to exceed that uh, even more in the, in the coming decades. Now, that is uh, an evolutionary crisis. Uh, it's not only an ecological crisis of uh, pushing against uh, the limits to growth, uh, what the planet can sustain. It's an evolutionary crisis because who are we that we would overconsume uh, the Earth and put ourselves into such a uh, difficult uh, situation? So, um, we, I've been saying since 1978, in the 2020s, we're going to hit an evolutionary wall. And people have said, well, that's more than 40 years from now. And, uh, well, okay, now it's three years from now. And um, so I've been watching this decade by decade by decade. And uh, I think, yeah, somewhere in the 2020s, uh, we're, the, the rubber is going to hit the road. We're going to have to make some choices, not only individually, not only as nations, but as a human family. And if we don't make those choices, we are going to move from uh, an unraveling, a very difficult situation into an evolutionary collapse. So uh, these are dangerous times, in a sense. If we don't step up to the game and use our capacity for conscious choice and collaboration, uh, if we pull apart in conflict, uh, these are very dangerous, very dangerous times. Mm. Just a footnote here. People interested in this notion of carrying capacity might want to watch my interview with Michael Dowd. And also, um, there's a link on my page of that interview to a book by a guy named William Catton, where he talks a lot about carrying capacity of the earth, yeah. um, which I'm sure you've studied. Um, yes. So do you get the sense that we are stepping up to the game or how, how have you phrased it, that we are uh, meeting these challenges or are we just blithely going along and going shopping? No, we're in denial. Yeah. Uh, we're significantly in denial and we're in what I would call soft denial. Soft denial is where you say, well, yeah, we do have, let's say, too many people uh, with current uh, levels and patterns of consumption. We, we do have climate change, for example. Uh, but they would say, well, climate change won't hit us very soon. It'll be another 50 or 100 years. Or oh, it won't be so bad. It may actually improve uh, our agriculture. Uh, it won't impact the entire Earth, just some selected portions of it. In different ways, people are diminishing and pushing away the realities of our, of our situation. And my sense is by the 2020s, the next five to 10 years, we won't be able to push it away. Uh, it'll be on top of us, and um, and we will have to deal with the uh, with the earth that we have allowed to emerge. Mm. Incidentally, um, the re I just want to interject that the reason I think that the discussion we're having right now is relevant to the theme of bat gap is that I I do feel that there is a, um, a spiritual awakening taking place in the world. I, th I think, and this is my opinion, that it's in, and we'll see what you think, is that it's in response to or in somehow in sync with the, um, the, the crisis that has become insurmountable through any uh, conventional solutions and that ultimately all problems can be seen as spiritual problems, as symptomatic of insufficient development of consciousness and development of all the facets of personality that um, should go along with spiritual development and that you know just as lack of development in certain ways results in problems in an individual's life l lack of development on a mass scale among seven billion people results in global problems and um, I think yeah. that as individual consciousness rises as it seems to be doing more and more and more that will bring about uh, shifts in the world and its problems just as it does in an individual's life. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, I think that spirituality, yes. some people, I, I, actually I was at a, the SAN conference one year and some guy was asking a spiritual teacher who was up on stage about um, 
the, the environment and cli climate change and stuff like that. Yeah. And the, the guy sort of brushed it off. It's like, oh, the earth is like a little speck of dust, and what does it matter? But you know, I think it matters tremendously. Um, tremendously. You know, you wouldn't say that if you were in a desert dying of thirst. You'd want water. So, so in any case, uh, I just wanted to interject that to bring yeah. this into the picture of the relevance to this show, and uh, let's have your um, comments on it. Well, uh, I think uh, we're facing a very pivotal choice as a human family. Uh, it's either breakdown or breakthrough. Uh, we're seeing, I think, a very predictable process of institutional breakdown. It's, and it's to be expected. I mean, if we are transitioning from one societal paradigm of nation states and materialism into another, which is the global reality and uh, in a living universe, let's say. Uh, this is a, a pivotal change beyond which, beyond anything we've ever experienced as a human family. We've never done this before collectively uh, in such a short period of time. This is uh, evolution in the raw. This is a hyper compression. Uh, w this is going to be a very, very, uh, I think, demanding and difficult transition to go through. And... Uh, the push of necessity, though, in, in responding to what you're saying, Rick, the spiritual awakening, the push of necessity is being met by the pull of an extraordinary opportunity. And the opportunity is for us to find through the collective uh, inside of our wisdom traditions, the, the understanding we're living in a living universe. Let's wake up. Let's grow into that aliveness. Let's collaborate. Let's work together. Let's create a, an economy of aliveness. Let's create a culture of aliveness. Let's create the artistry. Let's create the education. This is an amazing time to be alive and to be creatively engaged in uh, the kind of spiritual enterprise that you were speaking about. Uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. So uh, on the one hand, this we're, these are desperate times in some respects, but they're pushing us into extraordinary times of creativity and innovation globally, as well as right on the ground locally, creating new kinds of community that will support that new kind of uh, living economy. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, one, one idea of the living universe is that it, it is responsive to what we do. Like there's that old margarine commercial, you know, it's not nice to fool mother nature, <laughs> if you remember that. Um, and, uh, you know, there's going to be blowback and you can't just sort yeah. of dump billions of tons of crap into the atmosphere, per, per, you know, on and on and on and it not expect s serious consequences. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, a couple of thoughts here. Well, how do you, as again, as a futurist, as a guy who has been studying trends all of his life and, and um, you know, probably looking at the news every day and seeing to what extent it fulfills your predictions. I mean, how, how do you see it playing out over the next five, ten years? Um, since you said a minute ago that we seem not to be in denial, or at least soft denial, um, and what's going to wake us up, get us in agreement, make us get on board? Yeah. Uh, or is there going to have to be complete and utter chaos before we um, manage to sort things out? Well, that's not really the question. <clears throat> If you see someone that's an, an alcoholic, uh, they didn't have to uh, lose the job, uh, the family, the car, the house, and all the rest. Uh, but perhaps they did. Maybe they had to hit bottom. Now, are we like that as a uh, human family? Do we have to hit bottom uh, materially? Are you, another possibility is that we could visualize, we could use our mass media to say, well, look, what is it going to look like if we continue along this path? Uh, what will the world look like 20, 40, 50 years from now? What would it look like if we took another path? And let's work into the future in our social imagination rather than trying to work it out uh, uh, passively and let it unfold by itself. Uh, too little, too late, if you will. So uh, we have right now a choice to either pull together as a human family or pull apart. And right now you can see around the world, not only in this country, the kind of 
pulling back the conservatism, but in France you can see that, in other parts, uh, Italy, other parts of the world. So the world is kind of hunkering down. It's saying, uh, golly, this looks like a dangerous place. I better take care of myself. And actually, the best way to take care of ourselves individually is to reach out collectively and say, let's reconfigure this in a way that really serves the whole world being sustainable over the long haul. And that's the challenge and the extraordinary creative opportunity in front of us. Seems like both things are happening at once, as if, they are. As if polarities are increasing, you know. Um, more and more people are reaching out, more and more people are pulling back, and uh, it's as, as yeah. if the, the sheep and the goats are being separated or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. indeed. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to, play, to see it play out. Um, I have a lot of feeling that a lot of the great spiritual teachers who've come along have known and have predicted, in fact they have, that times were changing, that things like this were going to happen. Um, in fact, there's a book that I read in the 70s called by Moira Timms called Prophecies and Predictions, Everyone's Guide to the Coming Changes. And she took all these ancient traditions and what they predicted uh, from around the world and then correlated them with events that had actually unfolded or, since those predictions were made and up to the present time, which at that time was the 70s or maybe early 80s. And then she projected forward in terms of how she thought things might unfold um, and f bring fulfillment to those predictions. And basically they all agreed that there was going to be, as you have said, a time of great turmoil, and, but that things would look good on the other side of it. Yeah, there, it's a promising future if we'll just step up to the game. Um, there are two, way, two ways of looking at this. <clears throat> One is the more research-oriented, analytical approach to say, well, let's look at population, let's look at resources in the environment, these driving trends. And I've done that for decades. Um, but people find that uh, disempowering. They say, well, I don't really understand trends, and I don't know quite what you're talking about. And so, in a way, we need other, another language for looking at our times of great transition. And so I have pulled back from uh, more, let's say, looking at driving trends to look at stories, mm. uh, stories of great transition. Because I think story gives us a way to get a hold of what's going on, to simplify it, and to make it real in our own personal lives. And so let me give you an example. I've gone around the world over the last 20 years with the following story, um, and I'll, step up to an audience and I'll say, look, before I say anything, let me ask you a question. The question is this, what is the life stage of the human family? What is the life stage of the human family? Are we toddlers? Are we teenagers? Are we adults or are we elders? Four choices. And I say, before I say anything, I want you to talk among yourselves and we're going to make a, do a vote as a community and see what life stage we're in. Toddlers, teenagers, adults or elders. I have people talk and we come back and truly all around the world again and again and again, overwhelmingly people say, we're teenagers, we're, teenagers. Yeah. we're acting like adolescents, we're acting like teenagers. Um, and uh, I, 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 I remind I, us I of was, what the way I'm, we've all been those, but remind us of what teenagers do and why, why that's relevant to the way we're behaving. Yeah. Well. The teenager says, uh, well, I want it, and I want it all right now. And uh, I am what I consume. Uh, look at the brands that I'm wearing. Who's in, who's out? Uh, it's, it's like a us and them kind of mentality, um, and so on. And I'm indestructible. Um, That's another one. You know, yes. I, I can take these drugs. I can drink this, yeah. this, this booze or whatever. I'm fine. I'm, right. I'm going to live forever. That's right. So... Um, then I'll say to people, okay, the, uh, well then you told me we're in our adolescence. Okay, what did you do to move from your adolescence to your adulthood? Because what was the most important for you is probably what's going to be most important for all of us. And people will say, well, look, uh, it was a role model. Uh, someone really inspired me to live a different life. And I say, well, where are the role models? 
it's sports stars and movie stars. Are they taking us beyond adolescence? Uh, no. Okay, well, uh, it was a bigger story about life. Well, where are the stories about life? It's on television for the most part. And there are stories about uh, pretty mean-spirited, uh, <laughs> not so spiritually motivated uh, people, if you will. And so the stories that we have aren't taking us into a more uh, promising uh, future. Uh, someone will say, well, look, uh, what really got me moving into my adulthood was I took a hard look in the mirror. And I say, well, look, um, are we taking a hard look in the mirror as a society? Uh, well, where is that? That's in television. Well, you look at television, we're not seeing ourselves, we're seeing a distorted image of a consumerist, materialistic mindset, if you will. Um, so my point is, if we look at some of these stories like humanity is growing up, there are all kinds of insights that come from our personal experience that we could say, you know, let's have role models, let's have bigger stories, let's have these changes that we know work in our own personal lives and let's apply those to our collective evolution. And so there's deep wisdom that we already have that we could apply to help us understand what's happening uh, and then move into a more promising uh, future. Mm. Okay, so the adolescent thing is, is one of the things. Uh, another, another story of great transition that you outline is the global brain is waking up. Um, Want to riff on that one a little bit? Oh, that's so, uh, you know, uh, I will be standing around and uh, people have very different views on what's happening in the world. But if I just pull out my cell phone, hold it up, and I say, you know, is the global brain waking up? And uh, with that, that's all it takes. Um, someone's gonna say, you know, boy, for sure it is. It's, it's the uh, Occupy Wall Street. It's the, uh, it's the revolution that happened in the Middle East uh, a few years back. Arab Spring. And Arab Spring. And uh, we are now able to mobilize ourselves with a new kind of uh, capacity through the internet, through the uh, global brain waking up. And it turns out right now, 51% of the people on this planet have access to the internet. A majority of the people for the first time uh, in human history can talk with one another through the internet. It's already there. And if we want the technological capacity to have a dialogue as a human family about our collective future, we already have that capacity and it's growing very rapidly. Within two or three years, uh, it's not gonna be 50%, it's gonna be 60%. And it's just gonna keep growing and we are a wired world. We are becoming, uh, the global brain is waking up. And the question in my mind, will the global heart awaken fast enough to uh, help guide that global brain and its intelligence? Well, that's an interesting question. And um, obviously because of the communications, we're aware of deplorable things that we might have been oblivious of before, you know, um, you know, child prostitution in Bombay or, uh, you know, start a, a famine in the Sudan and, you know, different things like that. And um, so, I mean, some people feel like it's overwhelm and they, they really can't deal with all those things because their own life is, is you know, s such a project. But um, I, I think it's definitely, in many, in many people I speak with, it's definitely um, stirring compassion and uh, a sense of the world as my family to, to have that kind of uh, awareness of what, of what people are going through. Yeah, there, there's the receptive side and then there's the expressive side. And we're learning, 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 receiving. And as soon, I think we're going to be increasing the amount of expressing that we're doing through the internet and through the media. Uh, <clears throat> basically, I feel uh, we're not gonna have a real sense of hope without a sense of a strong voice for the body politic, for the citizens of this earth. And most citizens of this earth do not feel they have a strong voice. They feel disempowered, disconnected. Uh, the billionaires and oligarchs are running uh, the politics and so on. How can we have a voice in our collective future? Well, this is it. Uh, here, we're, we're, you're connecting with thousands of people and it could be billions potentially uh, because the technology is here to allow that connectivity to occur. So um, 
we're on the verge, I think, of uh, discovering uh, a new voice for the Earth. Uh, by using something that's never been there, which is this kind of technology to say, let's come together in ways that transcend nation states, the gridlock of nation state politics, and let's call for a more promising, sustainable future uh, for, for the earth. And I think is what's going to be required as institutions break down is for humanity to rise up in its collective voice to say we have a common future that we care for. So this is a key part of the transition. And as the media goes, as the social media goes, so goes the future, I, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. Even back in the 70s when I was teaching meditation here and there, I, I would often say, you know, look at what we can do now with, with video. I mean, a teacher, it used to be that a teacher could maybe reach as many people as he could walk around in that area, you know, in, in a lifetime in his sandals. And, uh, you know, it would take generation after generation for it to spread around the world if it did. And now we have videotapes that we can send all over the world. And at that point, we were starting to have satellites that could beam things live. But it's gone way beyond that now with, with the yeah. Internet. And in fact, you know, there, there was a saying that freedom of the press belongs to those who own one. And in, in a sense that now we all own one. In, yeah. You know, we can all be broadcasters if we want to be and uh, That's right. get something out there as, as BatGap is ex an example of. So you had a third story uh, on your transition stories, which is <laughs> I, yeah. a time of planetary birth. Something new yes. is being born, a species civilization. Yeah. Uh, and so what, once again, a story. And the idea is uh, to find stories that are common to the entire human family. And uh, virtually the entire human family says, yeah, I understand uh, the, we're maturing, we're growing up. I understand uh, the Internet and we have access to the Internet and the global brain is waking up. The third one that's very powerful in my uh, experience is people saying this is like a, a, a time of birth. Because what's being born is not uh, is something that hasn't existed before. And that's a global citizen. Mm -hmm. And the birth process itself. Uh, is very instructive for what we are experiencing. Uh, in, in birth, there's contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation, until finally that process reaches a, a, a crescendo and then there's no more uh, relaxation. It is just birth. Yeah, and then on the other side of that birth, is it may be a stillborn baby. Or it might be new life of a kind that we just don't know. And that's where we are. We are in times of contraction, relaxation, financial contraction, ecological contraction, relaxation. Um, and then I think in the 2020s, it's just going to be full on labor, <laughs> full on labor yeah. until we either give birth to a uh, sustainable species civilization or uh, we go down. It collapses. So uh, that's how I see, that's a very powerful metaphor for understanding the dynamics of change right now. Do you um, want to place your bets on which way it's going to go? Uh, okay. I tell people I wouldn't bet a dime that we're going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would bet my life. Hmm. And that's what I've done. That's a good answer. Um, I'm not putting any money down on it. I'm putting my life down on it. Yeah. Huh. Well, I'm optimistic. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, if I don't know what the optimum population of the Earth <laughs> should be, uh, and if if it's not seven billion, and if we're going to go through a readjustment period and get things to the way they should be, you know, the prospect of half the world's population not making it is actually pretty dire when you consider how that's going to play out. Um, I mean, climate change alone could cause hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people to have to migrate. And we've seen how yeah. that went with Syria, which was also caused by climate change. That's right. Imagine that on a global mass scale. Exactly. But anyway, I don't mean to be morbid or, you know, try to be a scaremonger, but I think it's, it's good to kind of contemplate this stuff, I think. And, Let's be real. Yeah. yeah. Let's get real here, um, because we are 
doing ourselves a great disservice to uh, pretend otherwise. Let's take a hard look at what's going down and begin uh, stepping up as, as a mature human family to the realities of what we created. And I know there's a promising future out there if we'll step up to uh, the challenges. Yeah. I mean, let's be real is a good, good phrase. I mean, there's all this sort of fake news out there these days and all this sort of denial of scientific evidence of things. Yeah. And um, in fact, you have a thing here. It kind of reminds me of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, or maybe that's where you got this. Stages right. of well, transition, denial, <laughs> confusion, anger, blame, recognition, acceptance, integration. Maybe we yes. could talk about that for a minute. Well, is, yes. So the question is, uh, as we go into these times of profound transition at a global scale, not just nationally, but globally, what are the psychological and cultural dynamics that will play out? Well, the first one is denial and, and just back and forth and just the waking up process itself is huge. And we're seeing and plenty of that even now, plenty of denial. Oh, huge amount. I don't think we have yet collectively uh, awoken to the uh, reality of our situation. Uh, a number of people have, but many people have not. So, so first stage is uh, that of denial. The second is, uh, I would say, confusion. Like, whoa, what is going on here? I didn't realize this was happening. I am confused. Uh, I, I don't understand. Uh, so the third is, okay, well, wait. If this is so messed up. Someone's to blame. Yeah. I'm upset. <laughs> uh, there's someone I'm, I'm going to be uh, blaming and anger, angry about. Um, and then I learn more. Well, it turns out maybe it's me. Uh, my behaviors, my consumerism and all the rest has been a contributing factor to the world that we have. So I have to move beyond blame to some degree of acceptance of my own uh, participation in what is being created here. And uh, beyond then, it's the, uh, that is then the final integration to say, okay, okay, I'll take responsibility, I'll grow up, I'll be a, a good a role model, uh, I'll create a bigger story, and here we go into another future. Mm -hmm. So there's a, an evolutionary dynamic of waking up, growing up, and then engaging with, uh, with this new world that we have yet to really move through. Yeah. You know, you've probably heard that, I think NASA says that at least two billion planet, there are probably at least two billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy, and uh, maybe it's even more than that, and that, you know, they now feel that there are probably uh, uh, more than two trillion galaxies in the known universe, and you talk in your book about what physicists say about the possibility of there being infinite numbers of universes. So, um, and uh, this being a living universe, uh, and the, with the, you know, the the abundance of Earth-like planets, and who said they have to be Earth-like, <laughs> um, the, the universe could very well be teeming with life, just absolutely yeah. buzzing with, with life. And I saw uh, Arrival last night, I thought it was a, a fantastic movie, but um, do you kind of feel, do you go this far in your futurism to um, contemplate uh, the our, our joining a larger um, community of of life forms uh, through who are you know like star trek kind of thing sure. well, once we have matured enough once we've gotten past the evolu the, the adolescent stage on this planet and are you know mature enough to be welcomed into the club so to speak right well i think you you hit it right on the nose that the prime directive in star trek the prime directive is you don't mess around with another species evolution right you you let it go you let it play out you don't interfere and my sense is um that we are being observed by other uh intelligences mm -hmm. uh are, they're just overwhelming evidence of something going on yeah. uh but at the same time i don't see interference uh in the uh, unfolding of what's happening so i think as you indicated rick uh First, we have to demonstrate our own maturity as a human family. To, our, we can take care of our own matter. We can take care of the earth. At that point, we're then good candidates for the galactic confederation or whatever it might be. Um, but we have to demonstrate our own maturity first, I think, before we're going to see um, uh, other other civilizations in, in, in connect with us. Yeah. Um. 
I think it was Groucho Marx who said, I, I wouldn't want to be a member of any club that would, I, I wouldn't want to join any club that would accept me as a member. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you know, who'd want us to sort of partner with them on, on, in a larger scale when we, we're making such a mess down here as it is? <laughs> but it's exciting. I mean, it, it might it seem is. like woo-woo, but it's exciting to consider because consider the technologies that might be out there and, and the benefit that those could have and so on. Uh, as some of our science fiction movies and books have have suggested, and uh, you know, if we could just get our act together a little bit more, we could make m much more accelerated progress than we've even made, and and you know, stop, you know, and really live in a in a marvelous world that's that's heavenly, not only technologically, not only consciousness-wise, but uh, and not and not resorting to some simple agrarian, you know digging with a plow kind of lifestyle, but, uh, you know, something that's both technologically and spiritually advanced to a profound yes. degree. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wrote this, uh, the book Voluntary Simplicity. Right. And there's a tendency, very strong tendency for people to say, well, that's a regressive right. lifestyle. It's going back. Yeah. Uh, to the past. No, it's going into a very promising future. And it's a future we have yet to really uh, imagine, create as a new kind of economy and all the rest. And so simplicity is the foundation for sustainability in this new uh, world. Also, um, uh, Arnold Toynbee, a famous uh, historian, he, he at one time had uh, over 20 volumes looking at the rise and fall of civilizations around the world. And he finally summarized everything he knew about the rise and fall of civilizations in one law uh, about civilizational growth. And it was called the law of progressive simplification. Hmm. Love it. The law of progressive simplification. And what he said was the measure of a civilization's growth is its ability to transfer energy and attention from the material side to the non-material side. A non-material side being like art, uh, education, uh, uh, the capacity to uh, govern ourselves with, with, a, with an informed body politic, uh, and so on. Uh, and so these ephemeral things were really the, uh, the pinnacle uh, of evolutionary achievement. And what we needed to do was to create the uh, strong material foundation for that to be developed. And what instead we're doing is uh, privileging the material foundation and not really going for the, the juice, the aliveness uh, that's there with the ephemeralization that Toynbee talks about, progressive simplification. Yeah, uh, we're saying things like, well, we need to cut education because the military needs more money and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 You mentioned in your book that American Indian lore speaks of three miracles. Uh, what are those yeah. miracles? Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, the first miracle is that anything exists at all. The second miracle is that living things exist, plants and animals. And the third miracle is that living things exist that know they exist, and that's ourselves, a uh, capacity for reflective consciousness. And uh, I often say we are so absorbed with that third miracle of our reflective knowing and, and consciousness and all the rest, there's a tendency to forget the first miracle that there's anything here at all. And that's where we started. The universe is a living system. Plato says it's a single living creature and we're a part of that larger aliveness. So if we forget the first miracle, we're forgetting the larger aliveness that we're part of. Uh, so it's vital uh, to remember the first miracle as well as the third miracle and in between them the rest of life so they're all <laughs> they're all important yeah now, there's something you mentioned in your book and I think I think Robert Lanza talks about this a lot um, and that is that the fine-tuning of dozens of key factors is essential because even the most minute variation would have resulted yeah. in no universe at all so right. you maybe could mention what a few of those key factors are I'm not so, um, I, I just know that I uh, had the expansion rate of the universe, for example, yeah. uh, when it was born, had it been ever infinitesimally either slower, it would have collapsed and, and into nothingness, or faster, it would, it, it would have inflated and just exploded into, uh, into, into uh, I don't know what. <laughs> but 
but it has this extremely uh, fine-tuned uh, capacity, neither uh, growing too fast or too slow, to be exactly steady in its its development over billions of years. Now, almost 14 billion years. Yeah, and there are a number of other such things. I mean, it's I've read articles and stuff about this, but there are so many different things that if they were just a teeny tiny bit off, we couldn't have had a universe. It just wouldn't That's have right. remained in existence. And so that, the reason I bring that up and the reason you brought it up in your book is that it, it again sort of points to there being some in, very profound intelligence that uh, yeah. seems to be orchestrating things. And um, there, are, there are scientists like Stephen Hawking who say, well, you know, yeah, but then there, there are probably an infinite number of universes and, or, and most of them didn't result in, in life. Ours is a fluke, you know, it's just a chance universe in which, which life was able to evolve. But um, I don't think it works that way. That's, a, that's an interesting opinion. Yeah. An opinion. It's like uh, a desperate attempt to <laughs> just to, to, you know, hang on to the materialistic <laughs> paradigm, really. <laughs> um, another thing you bring up in your book, which I've often, I mean, some of the times when we talk about, you know, uh, intelligence governing the universe and so on, people might say, well, that sounds like intelligent design. How would you contrast intelligent design as it's ordinarily defined with what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Intelligent, uh, often intelligent design is meant to say there is a designer that is it, it actively engaged in the unfolding of this universe. Mm -hmm. And so that has in the background this hidden designer that's intruding into uh, the reality of this world. Another way of looking at it is to say it's in, the, the universe is intelligently designed itself. It has uh, dimensions, for example. And every dimension opens up not only into a physical space, but a psychological space. If we see the universe in three dimensions, we're seeing the depth of things. In, in three dimensions, we can see nature going around and around. We can see nature's cycles and, and rhythms. Uh, if we go to four dimensions, we begin to see not only the cycles of going around and around, we begin to see relativistic dynamics, how one thing moves relative to another. And then we have the mindset, I think, that gives rise to the industrial era. Uh, and the and and the materialistic relativistic dynamics comes out of four dimensions, so the universe is intelligently designed. I feel in in its very foundations, the the dimensional structure of the universe not only structures physical space, but also psychological and spiritual space. And we are learning our way into more and more dimensional openings, more and more spaciousness in how we regard and engage uh, the universe. Yeah, and of course there are certain Eastern views of, of it that um, you know God is not only not some kind of old dude in you know in the clouds with a beard um, you know like acting like some kind of puppeteer, but God is he breathed I think the Upanishads say you know God breathed himself into creation that that the whole um, creation is really nothing but God. Yes. It, it, nothing but pure intelligence interacting within itself and yes. that we are like cells or if you will sense organs of that infinite intelligence that um, you know Muktananda used to say God dwells within you as you uh, and you know we're kind of seeing yeah. through various instruments whether we're an aardvark or a dog or a person or whatever it's that same divine intelligence um, living, experiencing a living reality through a particular nervous system. Exactly. See, that is, that brings us together. That transcends uh, all of these uh, places of division to say we're together in the aliveness of a living universe. Simple as that. And, and we can recognize that in our direct experience. It's not a, a concept. Love. It, it's, it's a feeling, it's a deep appreciation of our connectedness, our communion. We're a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects, as uh, Thomas Berry famously has said. Mm. So we're learning our way into a universe of, uh, of communion uh, with one another, with ourselves, and recognizing there is a vastly larger uh, opening, evolutionary beckoning uh, of us uh, to a higher uh, possibility. It will step beyond materialism and into aliveness. So, um, 
as you know, when I was reading your book, The, the Living Universe, I, I stumbled upon uh, a footnote um, that was several pages long, uh, all about continuous creation cosmology, and I found, yeah. that, I found that really exciting, and I had you send the text of it to me so I could send it to a physicist friend. And uh, so it gets a little heady, but, um, you know, let's talk about that for a few minutes. I think okay. it's fascinating. Go, why don't you explain what that is? Yeah. Um, many people have had the experience of um, just this last Christmas of uh, the uh, virtual reality, putting on one of those uh, headsets and entering into virtual reality and feeling uh, themselves immersed in another uh, world. And that's the, the, the kind of the cosmic hologram view of things, if you will, that uh, this universe is a kind of like a cosmic hologram and moment by moment it is being recreated. Uh, it's being refreshed, just like a, um, a, a film is refreshed moment by moment with a new projection, a moment by moment we're being refreshed with a, a new manifestation of the entire cosmos. And this insight is emerging not only from uh, the frontiers of cosmology and science, it's deeply uh, there in the world's wisdom traditions that the universe is, a, is being recreated in its totality moment by moment by moment. Now, the interesting thing about that, very interesting thing, first of all, if it is being recreated moment by moment, then there is what we would call a uh, in in uh, computer language a refresh rate the rate at which the screen gets refreshed uh, <clears throat> so the question is what is the refresh rate for the cosmic hologram because we are inside of it we can't stand outside and see that we have to make inferences from the inside of the hologram and what we can do is say well there's one thing that we know is constant, and that is the speed of light. The speed of light is constant. Why would the speed of light be constant? Well, what if the entire cosmic hologram is being woven together with precise evenness, precise simultaneity across the entire universe, and that is being lifted, the entire cosmic hologram is being lifted, manifested into existence at this continuous speed. And the premise that I have suggested is that the continuity uh, of creation at the cosmic scale has been seen as the constancy of the speed of light at the local scale. And so the, the, the constancy of the speed of light is then a byproduct of something happening at a much larger scale, the, con the cosmic scale of being continuously created moment by moment at a very precise, even flow. And that's, so I'm suggesting, hypothesizing, that's where uh, the constancy of the speed of light emerges from. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned in your book that the reason we can't, a, a physical object can't reach the speed of light uh, is that, as Einstein said, as it begins to approach it, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier, so you'd need greater and greater propulsion to, to continue accelerating, and at a certain point it would become almost infinite and you couldn't get that much propulsion. And, yeah. and secondly, it begins to collapse physically, as I understand it, yeah. Um, and um, so, and, and as that. you say, it's like you, you're trying to, by trying to approach the speed of light, you're trying to step outside the very thing that created you. Right. If this pen is getting created at the speed of light, and we move it up to the speed of light, it's going, and we try and move it faster than that, we're going to try and move it faster than the speed at which it's coming into existence. So if it's happening at the speed of light, it can't go faster than the speed at which it's arising in the first place. And as it approaches the speed at which it's coming together, it's going to run into itself becoming itself. As it runs into itself becoming itself, it's an impossible situation. It can't go faster than that. So there's the self-limiting nature of uh, relativistic dynamics that, that Einstein described. He didn't know why it did that. He just said it will do that. Yeah. I'm saying, why will it do that? Because it's running into itself, becoming itself. Yeah. Um, you quote, uh, might have been David Bohm here, as, yeah, as describing matter as condensed or frozen light. And, and there's a quote here, I don't know if this is you or Bohm, the solid, stable world of matter appears to be sustained at every instant by an underlying sea of quantum light. Um, and he 
comment on that before I elaborate or say anything more? <laughs> no, I, I think that um, oh, the basic building block of this reality is light. One way of regarding it is that, um, and it's so wonderful. Jesus was asked by one of his disciples, uh, uh, he said, what should we tell people if they ask us, where did we come from? And Jesus replied, this is the Gospel of Thomas. He said, well, if they ask you that, tell them we came from the light. We came from uh, the light, the place where light established itself of its own accord. Einstein would have loved that. We came from the light, the place where light established itself of its own accord. Um, so we're beings of light in a, in a light universe, if you will. Mm. Just the, one more thing about this continuous creation cosmology. I mean, we've all heard about the Big Bang, and there's this little tiny point, and it exploded, and it's been expanding out for 13.7 billion years. Um, but another way of th thinking of creation, which you've just alluded to, is is that um, it's happening continuously. It's not just something that happened, and, and we're just kind of expanding out. But uh, And physicists describe this as being the sort of manifestation from the unmanifest you know unified field level of creation to more and more and more and more manifest levels of creation and there are whole I've seen whole ch unified field charts that kind of explain all the sequ sequential spontaneous symmetry breaking as as more and more diversification happens as manifestation occurs and this is something that's happening continuously it's not just something that happened a long time ago and you're saying that it happens at the speed of light Essentially, that's a yes. Uh, that's a crudely stated, if you will, because light, the speed of light then is not necessarily constant. It can vary, but the, what's, what's required is the consistency of creation at the cosmic scale. Mm. And the byproduct of that is the constancy of the speed of light at the local scale. Mm. It's interesting to consider that if you could, if you were a photon, you know, then for you, there is, it's almost like as if you're omnipresent. Uh, photons coming from the Andromeda galaxy appear to us to take two million years to get here, but from the perspective of the photon, if you, uh, it's, it's, the trip is instantaneous, which kind of means that everything is everywhere. Everything is here now, and that the, the, photon, could almost, right. the photon could almost say, I am omnipresent. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, quant the, the quantum reality uh, we know is that. We know that in the quantum realm, non-locality is real. It's been demonstrated again and again and again. And so the non-locality means at, at, at the subatomic quantum level, we are connecting with the entire universe. Yeah. It's a unified system. And so on the other hand, in, uh, we see ourselves as very unique, differentiated, all the rest. That's true. And, and the, the amazing thing is both are true. We're both unique, absolutely unique and absolutely a part of the uh, cosmic whole. Mm. So we're, we're, we're both unique and whole, and, and there's no uh, problem in having those both be true. Yeah. I mean, you were saying a minute ago that Jesus said that we come from light, and you know, we've, we were quoting earlier that it's all God, that, you know, and, and people have said God is light. Um, I don't know, that, I don't know how to quite tie those thoughts together, but there's, there's something very interesting in all that. Oh yeah, we're beings of light, and we're becoming enlightened. Yeah, we're waking up to our uh, the light within. Huh. Um, here's something nice you say: awakening is never finished. We'll forever be enlightening ourselves, becoming lighter, so that we will have the ability to participate in ever more free, subtle, open, delicate, and expressive ecologies of of being and becoming. Yeah. Uh, you, I, okay. Something I think is really important uh, in my estimation. What we're doing here, we're we're just getting a hold of ourselves here. Uh, we're not in the in the three thousandth dimension of an infinite universe, or the three hundredth, or the third. We're in the third dimension. We're only two steps above a black hole. We're just getting started. We're just crawling out of the contraction of a black hole to get to a place of uh, uh, presenting ourselves as differentiated beings in this universe. And I think our challenge now is to get a hold of ourselves in the sense of recognizing the light within the invisible aspects within ourselves that are actually the majority of ourselves is invisible. 
95, 96% of the known universe is invisible. That includes us. Mm. And we need to get a hold of the invisible because we are deep down inside a body of light, as you were saying. We're a body of love. We're a body of music, resonance. Uh, we're a body of knowing. These are all invisible. But if we use our time while we have this visible body, this biodegradable body, if we use it now to explore uh, that we're a being of light, love, music, knowing, we can then take those qualities of being into the deep ecology of the, of the universe. And, and we may die, obviously, uh, but we know ourselves as a body of light, love, music, and knowing. Then we have a body that can move into the deepest ecologies of the living universe without, without forgetting itself. Mm. And so the universe is saying, in freedom, do this. In freedom. Uh, discover yourself, find yourself, discover that third miracle of knowing that you know that you are a being of reflective consciousness in this living universe. Mm. I'm reminded of that quote from the Bible, if your eye is single, your whole body will be filled with light. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> a question came in, this might be a good one for us to aim toward wrapping up on because it's kind of pra okay. practical. It's, okay. um, it's from Mark Peters in Santa Clara, California, who often sends in questions. And the question is, um, how have your insights impacted your own lifestyle? Have you consciously endeavored to minimize your consumption and shrink your carbon footprint? <laughs> do, you, do you have any advice? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, it, it's radically impacted how I've lived my life. Uh, I dropped out of traditional employment, if you will, in 1976. That's 41 years ago. And I didn't have a, um, a, a savings. I didn't have a nest egg. I didn't have a, a source of income. I just said, it's time as a citizen of this universe to step up and engage a world in great transition. So um, I never would have done the work that I've done, uh, co-founding three nonprofits for media accountability, writing books and all the rest had I been intent upon uh, living a more comfortable lifestyle with, uh, with more uh, secure income, often I will have only two or three months of uh, secure income in front of me. Even now? Uh, even now. Yeah. Even now. Um, I feel very grateful to know three months from now, I've, got, I've still got some uh, money in front of me. <laughs> so this is a very... Uh, challenging uh, way to live uh, uh, but on the other hand I am hugely grateful for the uh, the great gifts I've been given for being willing to to do that if mm. you will well that's wonderful um, and as far as other people are concerned who you know raising families and doing this and that and um, you're not suggesting I, I suppose that everyone go out and quit their job but um, you know what what kind of takeaway points can people take from this interview that they could apply in their own lives without well they might want to make some radical change or maybe yeah. there are some smaller incremental changes they can make that wouldn't upset the apple cart too much you know i i tell people these are these are the most profound turning times that the human species has ever encountered uh, that's what we're going into. And let's not pull back from actually describing what's going on. This is the, the greatest transition uh, humanity has ever uh, gone through. And uh, this is going to be a rough ride, I feel, just looking at the, uh, the dynamics uh, at the time. And <clears throat> what I, I would encourage is that find your true gifts. Find those talents, those skills that you have. Uh, that will contribute to a more uh, sustainable uh, future and a more sustainable community. And having lived in a co-housing community, kind of an eco-village community, as I look at the future, I think one of the best things to do is to start developing multiple skill sets. For example, you might be a, a lawyer, but you could also be a gardener and you could also be learning woodworking skills and you could learn uh, maybe elder care or education or whatever. And if you're in a small, uh, let's say, eco-village community, 
uh, and you have a, a, a range of skill sets and you know how to garden, you know how to maybe work with solar, you maybe uh, know how to work with kids and so on, and you can bring those skill sets together, you have a livelihood, you have a future of meaning and purpose uh, that will carry you into the future. So I see a new kind of um, arrangement of um, skill sets to live in community uh, in a sustainable uh, way as we make this great transition into a more promising uh, future. So I would say uh, forget the near gifts that you have uh, that you probably have used to earn a living. What are the true gifts that you have that will really take us uh, into a more uh, promising future? Now is the time to reach for those true gifts. Yeah, I think one value of everyone kind of studying a little bit of sort of futurism and future predictions and stuff is just to sort of put things in context. I mean, it seems to me that most societies in general never, they kind of feel like things are always going to be the way they are now. You can yeah. imagine people in the 1800s thinking, oh, we're always going to have railroads. That's going to be the fastest means of transportation and horses and buggies, of course, you know, and, uh, and you know, if you were a blacksmith, then at a certain point your livelihood got seriously threatened by, by the automobile coming along and you could either hang on to that or you could learn new skills, as you were saying. And um, it's interesting kind of during the last campaign, Trump going to West Virginia and saying, well, I'm going to bring back coal mining. We're going to mine so much coal. I mean, the coal industry is dead. And, uh, you know, there was a guy on the news just the other night saying, well, he said he's going to bring back the steel mills. I'm so excited about that. But um, we have to be more agile than that. And, if, yes. and we can either do it willingly or we can just have the rug pulled out from under us. Yeah. I, I, the word agile is so appropriate. We have to be nimble. We have to be light on our feet. We have to be able to move uh, because these are transition times and the ability to move, to be light on your feet, to be nimble in, in your businesses and your work and your life is critical, I think, for um, viability in this future. Mm. And you know, the thought that comes to mind when you say that is something really valuable is to have some, I mean, most of the people listening to this, ha this show have this, but some sort of spiritual practice that really works for you because it makes you more nimble, it makes you more flexible, yeah. it makes you more creative, more re less um, habitual, less conditioned, and all that. So you can really kind of go with the flow a lot more and, and jump at opportunities when they come along. Yeah. So the, the whole idea of a living universe is a reframe of spirituality. And as in my cosmology, uh, intimacy with the living universe is spirituality. That's spirituality, it's becoming intimate with the ordinary reality around us um, and engaging that in, in, in its depth. Uh, uh, that is a miracle. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Great. All right, well, that'd probably be a good note to end on. Um, Great. Yeah. So. You, you want to make any kind of wrap-up point, or was that a good enough no, wrap-up point right that's there? That's wonderful. Yeah, that's good. No. Okay, great. So let me make a couple of general ones. Um, just that as most people watching this know, this is an ongoing series, and um, we keep putting up a new one each week. Um, if you found this show interesting and, and it's new to you, uh, you might want to go to batgap.com and check out previous ones. And you could also sign up to be notified by email each time a new one is posted. And there's quite a few other things on the side. I won't run through them all, but there's an at-a-glance menu, which if you look at that, you'll kind of see what's available on, on batgap.com. So I really appreciate you your listening or watching. Um, next week, I'll be speaking to a fellow uh, named Brian Yosef, who's going to talk about um, enlightenment and awakening from the perspective of Judaism. And I've never really covered mm. that topic. And um, he himself is, uh, I'm not sure if he's a rabbi or, or is just very deeply into Judaism, but also had a very profound spiritual awakening. And uh, so that'll be an interesting thing to discuss. So thank you, Duane. Thank you, Rick. It's been a lot of fun. Good to be here. Yeah. yeah. And I'll probably see you in October at the Science and Non-Duality Conference. I look forward to it. Yeah. And thanks, okay. thanks again to those who've been listening or watching, and we'll see you next week.